Hi, welcome to The Wandering Wesleyan. I'm Chaplain Greg and our Walking in the Word series. Today we have another sermon. And this is a sermon that I gave um, that had to do with the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, our church went through a series of sermons and, and I had the uh, last sermon in the series. And so this is on the Sermon on the Mount. I hope you enjoy it. Um, and uh, please leave any comments in, in the comment section. If you like this material, please like and subscribe. And uh, if you have any questions or concerns, please email me at wanderingwesleyan at hotmail.com. But uh, until next week, when we're going to get into Luke and Acts, here's a sermon on the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, so good to see you all today. Um, I was teaching Sunday school this morning, and uh, coming out of Sunday school, I realized I had been talking a lot. <laughs> you talk a lot? Go figure. <laughs> And I thought as I was uh, coming out, well, you know, I think I'll just mouth the words to the song today. Just save my voice, take care of it. But when the Holy Spirit-infused piano playing of uh, Kathy starts going, uh, forget it. I'm just... So if I crack up in the middle of the, uh, in the sermon and just getting a little hoarse, blame Kathy. That's her fault. It's an honor once again to be able to speak to you, and uh, we do indeed pray for Pastor Brandon and all the others that are on the marriage retreat this morning, that they would be truly blessed. And uh, we welcome those that are online watching. Uh, we thank you that you've joined us and are uh, experiencing our little church today. And uh, we're going to be continuing and finishing the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Pastor Brandon did Matthew 5, PJ did Matthew 6 last week, and I'm doing Matthew 7 this week. And uh, this section of Matthew's Gospel is dense. There's a lot to it. There's lots of subjects and lots of sermon material, and as Brandon and PJ could probably attest, it's really hard not just finding what to preach, but what not to preach, because there's just so much in there. John, John Wesley himself took 13 sermons to go through the Sermon on the Mount. And he barely scratched the surface of what's there. And these were not short sermons. John Wesley did not have short sermons. So I, I admit, I was kind of stuck. I'd known about preaching. So I, I, I was kind of stuck uh, on where to go. And I've known about this sermon for two months. And I just I couldn't figure out where to go with this. Um, and then last week, I started reading a book by N.T. Wright. And if you could just show that up there. The book is called Who Jesus Was and Is. Um, the Challenge of Jesus, Rediscovering Who Jesus Was and Is. Uh, amazing book. And he talks a lot about a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about this morning. Also, I've been listening a lot to the Bible Project podcast. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and um, if, I, if somebody said you have to get rid of all of them but one, that's the one I would keep. Um, they're going through the entire Torah this whole year. They're taking the whole year to look at the Torah, and uh, a lot of what they've been talking about all year long really kind of inspired me in this. So, uh, but part of the problem when approaching the three chapters that we call the Sermon of the Mount is that our 21st century Western minds, we like breaking things down into subjects and to topics and sequences. And when we see the sermon, we see it as a series of like individual sayings, because sometimes one doesn't match the next one. So, you know, we, we think of these as individual sayings. And modern academics actually believe that Matthew, when he was putting together his gospel, and especially this section of the Sermon on the Mount, took uh, many of the sayings of Jesus, put it together, and was building a narrative. And I think, I think they're right on that. But I think we miss a little something in what the genius of Matthew, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is trying to tell us. And he's taken what Jesus said and has reframed the Jewish law for a new covenant. Wow, that's a big, bold statement. He's reframed the Jewish law for a new covenant. So let me break that down. 
For those who are taking the Sunday School Galatians class, what is just shouted out? What's the most important rule for Bible study? Context. That's right. So the context of a passage is important. Each word in the, is in the context of the sentence, which is in the context of the paragraph, which is in the context of the section, which is in the context of the book, which is in the context of the Bible. It's all connected is what I'm trying to say. There's, everything you read in Scripture is hyperlinked to someplace else in Scripture. And that's cool. That's a neat thing. Um, so when Moses gave the law to Israel in Exodus and Leviticus, it really wasn't just for those people during that time. It was meant for all people through all time. But that doesn't mean that the Jewish Levitical law stays stagnant. Now, you might be asking, in the next slide, I have uh, Deuteronomy 4.2, and you might say, but Greg, doesn't it say in Deuteronomy 4.2, do not add or subtract from the commands I am giving you, thus saith the Lord in our King James Version. Just obey the commands of the Lord and your, your God that I am giving you. Yep, it definitely says that. However, the book of Deuteronomy itself is an updating of the law. It was given to the Israelites fresh out of Egypt. And uh, it was given to a group of people who were just slaves and were looking to take the promised land. They didn't. And now one generation later, in Deuteronomy, Moses is updating the law. He's not adding to it. He's not taking away. He's bringing it into a new context for a new people. Nothing was added or removed. It was just restated. And when Matthew wrote his gospel, it was a distinctively Jewish gospel. As you're reading through Matthew, you get the sense that he's writing it for a largely Jewish-believing audience. We know this because of how he phrases ideas and concepts. He uses themes that are essential to Jewish life, such as, uh, such as the law, such as Sabbath, such as the temple. All of these things are really important to Matthew's gospel. And here, in the Sermon on the Mount, we have a retelling of the law. The law would be a central theme for Matthew, and it needs an update for New Covenant people because Jesus has come. And it brings us to chapter 7. And the conclusion of this ancient Jewish Christian literary masterpiece, one of the best ways to read the three chapters is as a unit. And one of my favorite kinds of Bibles is what we call a reader's Bible. And it takes out chapters and verses so that you're reading it, really, how up until maybe, you know, the 14th or 15th century, how everybody read scripture. You know, no chapters or verses, you just read it. It's a great way of reading it. Now, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but let me highlight a few key themes as we put all this together. When all the clutter is removed and the flow and the connection of Scripture is revealed, we get to see some themes that, that start popping out. So in this section, we're going to hit the first of several famous verses. In this chapter, they're highly misused. And the verses are very familiar, and the, mis and the misuses are familiar. But this chapter 7 starts with a section on judgment, and it says, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. So commonly, this has been used by more secular voices to say, Those who hold moral positions are judging people. So the conversation would happen something like this. Person one says, I believe this and so is wrong. And the second person says, well, doesn't the Bible say not to judge? That is precisely not what Jesus is telling us. This section is actually a hyperlink that is connected to the beginning of the sermon and the Beatitudes. Jesus is not saying, do not hold moral convictions. He's saying how you treat people matters. 
The hypocrisy is not that you hold a moral position. No, the hypocrisy is holding a moral code and thinking you're better than someone else. As PJ stated, stated last week, your motivation matters. It all reduces our faith to just a moral code of right and wrong. It's a code that fails. Our faith should be on Jesus alone. In verse 6, we get an interesting saying right after this piece on judgment. And it's a tough one. Don't give what is holy to dogs or toss your pearls before pigs or they will trample on them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. That's a tough thing to read right after they tell you not to judge, right? What's up with that? Well, it's challenging. But we have to understand how first century people wrote and thought, okay? First century Jewish literature and the first century Jew was a global thinker. What do I mean by that? Well, there are global thinkers and then there are linear thinkers. I am a linear thinker. You give me a list of 12 things, I'm going to start at one, I'm going to complete one, and I will not start two until one is completed. And when two is completed, then we will go to three. Carrie, on the other hand, is not a linear thinker. She is a global thinker. She gets a list of 12 things, and she looks at it and says, oh, five looks like fun. Let's go do five. <laughs> and we'll get 75% of five done, and then think, well, you know, seven it needs to be done, so we'll go and do seven. We'll leave that part undone and do seven. Do half of seven, then go to three, because three's right nearby. So we better go do three. The list gets done. But it's different, right? I do things this way, she does things that way. So the Jewish mind is more of a global thinker. So when you read this verse, it's odd when you think literally, literally, you know, the passage on don't judge, and then this verse about giving things to pigs and dogs and swine. Um, but it's actually hyperlinked to verses 13 through 23. So we've by bypassed a big section, right? We've bypassed a big section, and we're going to come back to that. But verse 6 is linked to verses 13 through 23, in that a significant number of people are going to reject God's rescue plan for humanity. Verses 13 through 14 talk about the narrow scope of this rescue. The Universalists have it dead wrong. There's only one way to redemption and fellowship with our Creator, and that is through Jesus and Jesus alone. There will be those that try to deceive us and lead us away from the narrow path. That's what that, verse, that passage talks about. And here is where verse 6 comes into play. We're to have nothing to do with them. Matthew has presented us with a revised law that looks not to what we do, but who we are. As verses 16 through 20 expound on, the fruit we bear matters more. Those who follow the strictest letter of the law or think their moral code makes them superior, as discussed in verses 1 through 5, may call on the Lord, but they are worshiping a system and not their Savior. So let's go back, verses 7 through 12, that section that we skipped. Here we have another one of those famous and very misused verses. In Matthew 7, verses 7 through 8 states, Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open for you, for everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. <clears throat> Excuse me. This section is linked back to actually chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. And in that part of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about don't be anxious for things. 
You know, what, don't, God's going to give you what you need. He supplies everything. Don't be anxious. So keep asking, and you're going to receive. Keep seeking. You're going to find it. Keep knocking, and the door will be open to you. We don't have to worry about what we need. God will provide for us. So we can approach him and ask him for what we truly need. Love, mercy, forgiveness, humility. That links back to the Beatitudes, right? All comes together. So many people use this passage as a sort of a Christmas wish list. If only I ask enough in Jesus' name, I'll get that new red Chevy Camaro with the black pinstripes as Carrie rolls her eyes. This is a heretical teaching. It's a heretical reading of this passage. We are to ask, seek, find the things of God. We are to ask, seek, and find Jesus. Why? Well, that's summed up in verse 12. And this should be pretty familiar to you as well. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. <clears throat> and when Matthew writes the law and the prophets, he's talking about the entire Old Testament canon. Everything in there is summed up. Do whatever you would like to them. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. The golden rule is sums up the entirety of the law. If we want to be loved by God, if we want to be forgiven by God, if we want to be provided for by God, then we need to show the same love, forgiveness, and provision to other people. The fruit that is spoken of in verses 16 through 20 is the fruit of the Beatitudes in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. All through these three chapters, Jesus appeals to a person's heart who they are. The heart of a person produces actions that produces fruit. The, that is the narrow gate. It is one, if one has a heart that loves God, then one will display that love in actions that show love to others. We can't simply say in any way, shape, or form we can't start with actions. It has to start with our motivations. It has to start with our heart. Actions won't change our heart. Actions are, reflect, are a reflection of our heart. And this finally brings me to the concluding verses. Verses 24 through 27. And Jesus is summoning, summing up the entire sermon here. Anyone anyone, Jew, Gentile, slave or free, male or female, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds his house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it will not collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who drives their minivan into the beach But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds his house on sand or drives his minivan on a beach. When the rains and floods come, they won't find Bubba Ray coming with his pickup truck to drag him out. When the rain and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. This is the word of God for the people of God. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is our firm foundation. I don't know if you've seen the previews for season three of The Chosen yet. Um, I know that they had in the theaters the first two episodes. Um, I, I can't wait to see it. Such a great series. But anyway, in the previews, Jesus is confronted by a person who seems to have a lot of religious authority. And the man says to Jesus, if you do not renounce your words, we have no choice but to follow the law of Moses. Jesus looks him right in the eye and he says, I am the law 
of Moses. Powerful stuff. That law is Jesus. Matthew has majestically used the words of Jesus to update the law of Moses. He states in chapter chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, that his mission is to fulfill the law. That is the solid rock. Jesus is the rock on which we build our lives. If we put our faith, hope, and trust into anything, we are building on a house of sand. If you're putting your faith, hope, and trust into money, sex, power, you're building your house on a house of sand. If you're putting your hope into politics, looking at doom and gloom if the opposite party comes into power, looking for sort of a utopia if your team actually comes to power, you're building your house on a house of sand. If you have a worldview that proclaims that your morality makes you a better person than others, you're worshiping your system and not your savior. Can any of that provide the transformative power of the presence of God? The answer is no. Listen to this quote by N.T. Wright, and this is from The Challenge of Jesus. The real new temple, the real house on the rock, will consist of the community that builds its life upon Jesus' words. All other attempts to create a new Israel a new temple. Remember Her- that Herod's temple was still being completed when Je- during Jesus' lifetime. A pure or revolutionary community would, lo- would be like building a house on sand. When the wind and storms came, it would fall with a great crash. And the temple did. 70 AD, it came down. Jesus was calling his hearers to take part in God's new drama, the great play in which Israel would at last fulfill her ancient vocation to be the light to the world. This was not to be a way, I'm sorry, this was to be the way of true love and justice through which Israel's God would be revealed to the watching world. Only through Jesus. And as the music team comes on up here, Let us keep that in mind. It's only through Jesus, only through his life, death, resurrection, sending of the Holy Spirit, can we find that solid rock that transforms our hearts and fills us with the presence of God, which is the Holy Spirit. All other ground is sinking sand. If you've not given your life to Jesus, if you've built your life on anything less, I invite you, as the team sings, to pray and give your life to him and him only. Invite him to be the center and the rock.